our ne uh, next presentation will be uh, done by Juan Mateos Garcia. Uh, he's a director of data analytics at Nesta, the UK Innovation Foundation. There he leads a team of data engineers, data scientists, data visualization developers, policy experts, and ethicists using data analytics to advance Nesta's missions. Juan has 10 years of experience using novel data and methods to inform policy and is a topic lead on novel data sources for the analysis of productivity and the digital economy at the Office for National Statistics, Economic Statistics Center of Excellence. Welcome, Juan, and floor is yours. Thanks so much, Medina. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and see if this works. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so hopefully people can see those slides. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So I'll get started. Um, so, I mean, the first thing to say is that I'm very honored to uh, take part in this epic event. Um, actually, um, Katie, Katie Borner and, and her work have been a, a, bit inspira a big inspiration for everything that I'm going to be talking about today. So it's just, um, uh, I feel very honored to be able to take part in this initiative and with such an impressive group of people uh, spanning the world and spanning obviously all, all time zones basically. Um, and I'm, what I'm gonna be try to do is simply to, I guess, uh, give Nesta's perspective on, on science mapping, innovation mapping, both uh, why it's important, how we do it, uh, some examples of what we have done and where we think the future is going to go. Some, some things we're working on and thinking about doing next that we're very excited about. So yeah, this is the, this is the structure that I'm going to follow. Um, and basically this will consist uh, of some slides with, um, I guess, images and, and text. And then at some points, uh, especially in um section number uh, uh, section number four of the presentation the gallery will go into some interactive demos and also i'm gonna put the the presentation in the chat so everyone can oh, actually i'll put the presentation in the chat uh, af uh, afterwards so that everybody has access to the slides and, and the links that uh, it contains so i guess like the first question we need to ask ourselves is is why map? Uh, why, um, why do we feel that it's so important to create maps of science, create maps of technology, create maps of industry, create maps of jobs? Um, and I guess what I'm gonna be doing is, I'm going to be illustrating why I think it's very important to map with the case uh, of uh, one emerging technology or emerged technology that I guess um, everybody is really interested in, excited about, scared of, which is artificial intelligence. And I'm just going to illustrate why it's important to map what's happening with this technology uh, and show you some of the work we have done at Nesta. And then after I've done that, I'll talk a bit about what Nesta does and so forth. So yeah, like with AI, you know, it's obviously, this, this technology that I guess enables machines to behave in a way that's more responsive to new situations and be, become more adaptable and flexible and maybe even start to be able to take decisions with capabilities that, that resemble in some ways human intellectual capabilities. And obviously this is um, currently a technology that's playing a role in search, and recommendations and social media and scientific research and development, but it's expanding and it's expanding into um, the built environment and buildings around us. It's expanding into robotics, expanding into self-driving cars, and uh, and uh, it has the potential to touch every aspect of our economy, society, and our lives. And I guess there are obviously people who are very excited about this. Um, and they are excited about the prospects uh, for transforming productivity, tackling big societal challenges around health, around the environment. But also there are people who are very concerned about this. And they are concerned about uh, automation and obviously 
all jobs going away and the social disruption this will bring. They are concerned around privacy. They are concerned around the, about the loss of autonomy if AI almost like makes all decisions for us. Concerned around safety, obviously the example of the Terminator here and what happens if we delegate decision rights around, um, you know, military staff to a machine, what would happen there? So there's like this sense of like, this could be very good, this could be very bad. Obviously, like, um, I'm a really boring person and I think like the reality is going to be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> but the question is, how do we how do we figure out where this is going and how do we make sure that it's evolving in a direction that's beneficial? Um, and the picture is complicated, actually, if you want to understand where AI is going. I'm, I'm not going to get into the detail of this of this diagram, but it's simply trying to say that the way this technology is going to go and the impact it's going to have and the value it's going to create depends on a complex system of researchers, scientists, businesses who are creating technologies, are applying technologies, the technologies that they develop themselves become the foundation for future technologies. And we really want to understand what's going on with this complex system so that we can put in place policies to direct it in a desirable direction, in a societally desirable direction. Um, and here is where, you know, we start to need maps. And I guess, you know, then the question becomes, what kind of maps do we need? And, you know, we can maybe uh, use very simple maps. And this is, this is a, the, the simplest map I could think of to look at AI. This is simply looking at the, the share of all papers in archive, which is a preprint repository that relate to AI over time. And this is a, a very simple, simple map with, um, yeah, it's two dimensions, right? It's time and volume of activity. And it's simply telling us that AI activity is growing very rapidly. Uh, and, and this is a thing that's useful to know because it kind of suggests that we should pay attention to it. But it's not really telling us a lot about where it's going, about who's participating, about what, what countries are leading, what countries are falling behind, in what sectors is this being applied, what impacts does it have? Um, and I guess what this means is that we need more complex maps. We need more advanced maps to understand all of those questions so that we can take the right policies. Uh, to, I guess, steer it in, in, in a desirable direction. And we need maps which are geographical, you know, and, and for example, what this map is showing is level of activity around AI in different countries, but it's not looking at all of AI. It's focusing at uh, AI technologies that are related to surveillance. Uh, and this is facial recognition, uh, so being able to recognize people's faces in videos, being able to track people through cameras, be able, be able to monitor what they do. And what we see actually is that when you look at this at this uh, uh, version of AI, this specific set of technologies around AI, um, um, actually countries like, like China, which I guess are, uh, have less democratic institutions, uh, have a much higher level of activity in terms of volume and also in terms of specialization. Although having said that, we also see a lot of activity in the US and a lot of activity in the UK as well. And I think this is very important to understand, right? Because um, I guess some people are concerned that AI might be evolving in a, in a direction that favors a surveillance state or surveillance capitalism where people are being spied and monitored and maybe manipulated. And, you know, just to see what, to which extent are these technologies being developed and who's developing them is something very important. So here's one example of one type of map. We might be interested in looking at semantic maps. Uh, and, and this is more, more almost like related to how different topics relate to each other. In this case, what this is looking at is basically the extent to which AI related topics connect with other topics in research. And this is using data from, um, UK uh, research grants. And I guess what we see over time, and, and, and by the way, the, the red, the red um, lines here are, are showing us um, the connections between AI topics and other topics. And simply what this is showing us is that at the beginning, AI topics are not so connected with, with other topics. And then over time, they start to become collect, connected because basically AI is started to tap into all sorts of disciplines and all, all, all sorts of areas of research. 
And again, this is interesting to know because we would like optimally AI to develop in a way that is not siloed and disconnected from other disciplines, but is tamping, tapping into those other disciplines and, and learning from them and contributing to them. We can look at maps which are institutional, and this map is basically a map of um, research institution, like research collaborations, uh, and basically what, this, and actually this one is interactive. So if I click here, we can look at, at you know, I guess we can zoom in a bit more in, in the map. And what this is showing is collaborations between different uh, um, research institutions doing AI. So, and we have Google, so we have like, um, I guess, private sector companies and tech companies, and we have um, um, academic institutions. Obviously, this is only focusing on the on the most active uh, AI research institutions. Um, and, and, and the idea here is to start to map collaboration networks and look at how, for example, uh, Google tends to collaborate with these institutions. Uh, you see like actually Chinese institutions collaborating more with each other, but also with Microsoft. Then you have a cluster of like institutions based on the EU. Uh, so it's interesting to understand how these organizations come together and work together, but it's also quite interesting to understand the extent to which um, basically uh, we are seeing the private sector becoming central in AI research networks. And actually, Google, I think, is the most active institution. Uh, other, other organizations like Microsoft, like IBM, very active. And, and this is connected with concerns about the idea that maybe the private sector is becoming dominant in setting the agenda for AI research because um, it has access to more researchers, it has access to more money, it has access to more data, it has access to more computational power to be able to implement like the most advanced AI models. So, um, so again, like to be able to map this and understand how the situation plays is something that's very useful for policymakers who at the end of the day would like to see the private sector advancing AI research, but also want to see an independent uh, uh, academic research sector contributing to AI research. And, and I guess maybe looking at the questions that the private sector won't look at, maybe, and also thinking ahead and trying to develop technologies and trying to develop methods that are maybe less, um, has less commercial potential now, and, and maybe um, there are less incentives for the private sector to invest on them. But, but the academics can do it in, in, way, in, in a way that helps us to create almost like the future AI revolution. So, uh, and then, you know, it's great to have interactive maps as well. And this one is actually one that's been developed by um, uh, one of my ex-colleagues uh, in, in Nesta called uh, Konstantinos Stathopoulos. And he developed this map as, um, while well, he was, uh, um, working in a, in a Mozilla fellowship. And it's basically a map of, um, of uh, biomedical research that, sorry, I'm just gonna try to open it so we can look at the interactivity. Um, so, and the idea was to be able to explore, um, again, like, um, here. Um, it's basically just like a really, <laughs> it just looks really cool. It's basically just, for example, being able to look at machine learning applications um, in um, in biomedical in this case, and we can look it by country. So maybe starting to get a sense of like the, the geography. Uh, let's see, Australia, you can search by topic. Uh, so yeah, and then you're getting lists of papers and you're actually getting lists of like the citations that the papers receive. And it's almost like a nice engine that allows you to maybe get a sense of the situation uh, of AI, like in this case, AI applications in different biomedical topics and find interesting research, which is obviously something, something that's very important in a context where we are having an explosion of research is how do, you, do we find interesting work? So, uh, so yeah, this is just like, giving you a sense of some of the things that it's almost like the opportunities to understand much better this, this important technology when we say let's map it in a way that embraces its complexity. Um, and, and then this yields a, a lot of evidence, a lot of information that can inform policies uh, about this, this technology which are much more nuanced and are not going to be about saying, oh yeah, let's do lots of AI and, and, and let's just like pump up 
AI and and and, and the important what's important is the volume, or policies which are about shutting it down or almost like trying to discourage it because we are concerned about its risks. I think if we have these much more sophisticated maps, we're able to like find paths in the middle that balance the opportunities and the risks in a much more intelligent way. Um, so yeah, that sets the scene for why mapping and gives you a few examples of things we have done and that colleagues have done at Nesta. And so now, having done that, I'm going to tell you about a bit about us. Um, so Nesta is the UK Innovation Agency for Social Good. And basically, uh, I guess our idea is that we, our society is facing, facing massive, massive challenges around health, education, sustainability. Um, and in order to tackle those challenges, we need innovation. Um, and what we have done is, um, you know, we, we have been working in this space for 20 years. And we have gone almost like through different incarnations. So Nesta used to be more like a think tank, then it became more, more of a funder. And now it's become it's becoming a mission driven innovator. So basically, we have identified a set of missions uh, that we re where we have like goals uh, that we want to achieve. And these missions are um, around um, education. So we want to basically um, reduce the achievement gaps uh, between people from different backgrounds uh, so that, um, I guess, people from more disadvantaged backgrounds, um, I guess, are not how would I say, are able to go through their early years in a way that doesn't determine what's happened to them for the rest of their lives. So very strong attention on, on social care, education, and things like that within that mission. Uh, we have a mission around a healthy life and, and with a very strong focus on tackling um, obesity uh, 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 in the UK and also very focused on, on mental health to, I guess, two areas that have a big impact on people's life expectancy and where we see big differences uh, uh, and inequalities between people from different backgrounds. And then also we have a mission around a sustainable future, where our goal is basically to, um, to basically uh, speed up and be able to deliver uh, the UK's decarbonization goals in a way that's consistent with, um, with a productive economy and an economy, I guess, that, that grows and, and, and creates value for more people, but yeah, in a way that's sustainable. So it's like Nesta's missions, and, and basically the idea is that within each of these um, very like challenging, big, uh, uh, difficult areas, uh, Nesta comes to basically try to drive innovation, and, and we do this in collaboration with other institutions. Like for example, we work with, um, we partner with um, a local government or a school. Um, for a regulator in order to basically explore innovations that help to achieve these goals, achieve these missions. Um, we also actually have a venture building a studio. So it's almost like a, a, a space that designs new companies that uh, are developing products and services and technologies and platforms that help us to tackle these challenges. And then we have this role, which is the system shaper, which is almost like trying to create um, an environment where it is possible for those innovations that help to address these uh, challenges to thrive. And this is by informing policy, by informing regulation, by informing culture, uh, uh, skills, even like, you know, almost like trying to change the way people think about some of these challenges so that um, we are able to tackle them more effectively. Um, and, and yeah, the, the, the way Nesta sets to deliver these innovations and fulfill these roles is by actually combining big subject expertise about, um, about these domains, like around health, around education, around sustainability, combine it with technical knowledge uh, around data, around behavioral science, around experimentation, around design. So the idea is that we create these multidisciplinary teams that come together uh, to tackle challenges in these areas, um, and yeah, one one of the one of the practices, one of the nested teams that's working in this space is data analytics, and that's the team I lead. Um, and basically, what we do is uh, use data analytics responsibly and innovatively to advance Nesta's missions. So this involves discovering, collecting, and processing data, 
This involves um, analyzing data and building and sharing models, uh, building data visualizations and products. And there's going to be a strong focus in the rest of the presentation on those and to do this all uh, ethically and efficiently. Uh, and I have some examples of projects here, which I'm not going to go into because actually there's going to be quite a few examples coming later. Um, basically, we have a team that does this uh, and it's uh, an interdisciplinary team. So it's a team that includes data developers, it includes data scientists, uh, it includes uh, people who do data visualization and build products. It's a team uh, that look focus on the, on the ethical side and making sure that we do all of our work ethically and responsibly. Uh, and then also we build infrastructure. Uh, and also we, we have a function which is focused on disco almost like discovering new data sets and assessing their potential and, and seeing how we can bring them into our work. Um, just checking the time. Um, so um, I guess like a couple of uh, points about our culture and how we work. So um, everything we do is open. Uh, so uh, we have very strong values around open data, open code. Uh, if you go to our GitHub, you will see we have lots of activity, lots of people, lots of repositories. Um, and yeah, basically you can get like a lot of what I'm going to be presenting and talking about today. You can go to, a, to, to our GitHub repo and, and get it and be able to work with it. And uh, I guess the idea is that in the same way in which we use open source software and we, um, I guess, um, almost like build on the on the stand on the shoulders of giants and people who have contributed before we are also contributing and hopefully that's one of the ways in which we can achieve impact and contribute to impact it's not just through the maps we build and the indicators we create and the research we do is also by creating infrastructure to do data science for social good and to do mapping for good that other people can use um so i'm just looking there's i think a quest yeah um and then um I guess something that's very important for us is as well a focus on ethics, because we acknowledge that sometimes, you know, when you're trying to do data science for good or mapping for good, you might actually face many big ethical challenges uh, and you can create ethical risks. You know, obviously there's risks around privacy, there's risks around misuse of the information that we create, there are risks around the representativity of the data we use and whether that creates challenges to fairness. Uh, there's many different risks uh, that we face and I guess we try to meet, identify those and mitigate those very carefully. And as I mentioned before, we have a team in Nesta that's uh, in, in the team that's focused on doing that. Uh, we have guidelines and processes to, to inform our mapping and our data science and data analytics work. Uh, so that yeah, we, as I said, be, uh, are able to tackle tackle those risks. Um, and I guess something that we are very interested in and excited about is this idea of um, uh, moral imagination. And I guess being quite open at the beginning of a project um, about not not coming into a project with the idea that this is going to be a data project and we're going to be the following map and it's going to be following the using the following methods but actually try to be reflective when we tackle a challenge and it's almost like a step outside of our roles and our disciplines to think holistically about what the what the challenge is and, and different ways to tackle it and some of like the values um, the way in which focusing on different values might lead to a different type of project um, so yeah, that's something that is very important for us and we're increasingly doing. Um, and so I guess, yeah, all of the maps I'm gonna be talking about and all of the work we do now and all of our future work is really trying to follow these principles um, in order to, yeah, be more inclusive and participatory and, um, and yeah, I guess more flexible in, in how we think about the, how we can tackle the challenges we face and, and, and deliver the projects we work on. Um, Okay, and maybe like focusing a bit more into the maps. Uh, so I guess like something else to, to say before I get into the examples is like this idea that a map on its own is not a map. Uh, so, you know, if I show you this map, obviously you would say, 
okay, this is telling me something about, in this case, AI research in the world and who's doing it and what type of research it is. But I would say that if I really give you this information, it is not enough to create value from it. I feel I need to give you much more than the, than the map, than the picture, than the indicators. I need to share with you the data, the underlying data, uh, so that you understand uh, you know, where all of this information is coming from. I want to tell you about the theory on which this uh, map is based. So in this case, it's a theory about the, the idea that different countries with different priorities might focus on different versions of a technology. And in doing so, they might shape where that technology goes in a way that might be problematic. Uh, so it's a, obviously a theory coming from evolutionary economics, from complexity economics, from um, social and technology uh, uh, studies, and, uh, sorry, um, science and technology and society studies. Um, so it's important for you to know that and for me to know that was the theory I'm using to inform my map. I want to tell you, share with you my code so you see how I build the map. And optimally, you will have this code to build your own future maps. And also, I need to be very mindful of the audience. Who's going to be using this information? How are they going to be using it? Uh, what kind of organization are they? How is this going to help them make decisions? Um, and also, how am I excluding, uh, by the way the map is designed, by the way it's built, by the way it communicates information, who is going to be not, not able to access this map? And that's something that we also think about a lot. And I guess, like, I hope that in the presentation, in the demos that follow about what we do, there's gonna you're gonna be able to see how this desire to be very holistic and very comprehensive in how we build our maps is gonna it's gonna be, I guess, concretized. You're really gonna be seeing how some of these things work in practice. So, let's show you a bit of a gallery of our maps. Um, and we'll begin with the economy. And I guess this is where uh, we're very interested in uh, the question of how can we monitor the evolution of the economy with more resolution and timeliness. Uh, and actually, this is maybe the map, which is it's the one I've worked with the most of all of the ones I'm going to present. And it's maybe the one that's most boring. So I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on it. Uh, um, but the idea with this, with this, uh, with this map is um, it's a project we did with um, a Scottish government in, in the UK to use uh, web data to monitor the impact of COVID-19 on local economies. So the idea was COVID-19 um, arrived and obviously it transformed the economy because of like social distancing, because of lockdowns, because of impact on value chains, because in, of increasing demand from, for some services and, and products. And basically what this meant was uh, a big shock on the economy and policymakers really wanted to be able to understand almost like in real time, what's happening to different parts of the country and how do we almost like support those economies so that they are able to get through the, the, the COVID crisis. And what we did was uh, basically use a combination of data from business websites and from search in order to be able to estimate almost like the level of exposure of different industries to COVID-19. Uh, and basically what this simply is showing is volume, of search for like different uh, terms um, as the pandemic goes. And, and this is, by the way, this is the beginning of 2020. And I guess this is when the COVID-19 crisis begins. And basically the idea is that we're able to monitor how much more interest in different topics there's been compared to a 2019 baseline. Um, and, uh, uh, and in doing that, in this understand um, so like what's the demand for the, product, the, the, the products and services from industries related to this topic. So for example, here we see uh, much less interest on activities that involve being out, doing casual things, doing uh, leisure things, which obviously um, go to restaurants and things like that. And basically we do that for everything. Uh, you see lots of interest in testing like towards the end of the year, I guess as the, as the uh, starts, tests start to become available. So we, saw, we use all of this information to get a sense of like demand for products and services related to these trends. Uh, and then we use that to look at what uh, local economies are exposed to COVID-19 based on the industries which are present in those economies. And, and this is simply looking at different parts of Scotland and their industries 
and the extent to which different industries are more or less exposed to COVID-19. Uh, and, and this is obviously looking at the evolution over time, because obviously with the pandemic at different points, we face different situations. We need to be able to almost like in, in real time, be able to see what's happening. You know, and for example, in this case, look at uh, this place, Highland, being highly exposed to COVID-19 in April because it's very reliant on accommodation and construction, on, on wholesale, on sports and activities, which are obviously things that were in, in crisis at that point. Uh, in August, it's going to be a different place. In October, when the virus comes back, it's going to be a different place. And it's really trying to um, get, a, get, a, get a sense of how the situation is evolving. Uh, also, like something we do is not just consider almost like whether a location is exposed to COVID-19 on a given month, but also whether it is able to diversify its economy in ways that make it more resilient to COVID-19. Uh, and the way we do this is by looking at um, similarities between industries and create this, this map of the economy that almost like allows you to see, um, hmm, this, the interactive is not working here. Oh, oh well. Um, allows you to see almost like if you are in this industry, which is creative arts, where can you diversify, which is less exposed to COVID-19? And for example, if you are in construction, you could move into build in, in, into services to buildings. You, you could move into landscaping and gardening, which is obviously being a big thing during the pandemic. But if you are in accommodation, you can only move into real estate, which I guess at certain points of the pandemic was highly still highly exposed to COVID-19. So it's almost like you are less resilient to COVID. And basically, we are able to, again, understand the situation in almost like in each local economy in Scotland and look at, be able to say, um, what is the share of the economy in sectors that are very exposed to COVID, but are not very able to diversify away from COVID. So, um, so yeah, it's almost like this. And again, the idea is to inform policies to um, help these, these, these places to, I guess, become more resilient to the pandemic. So, um, so yeah, that's like one example of um, our work looking at the economy, in this case, in collaboration with the Scottish government. And, then, and we built these maps, we built all of this information, and we shared it with them. And, and they used it to, I guess, they, to inform how they were looking at the evolution of the pandemic and how to respond to it. Um, I'm going to move now into more like interactive maps we have built. Uh, and I guess within these maps, uh, what we're interested in is understanding the state of innovation ecosystems and find opportunities and gaps. Uh, the first map I'm going to show you is one map we have built with the uh, Department for Business um, uh, in the UK. Uh, and this basically is a map that looks out to visualize the, 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 the state of innovation ecosystems in different parts of the country. This is a map built by my colleagues Luca Bonavita and Sebastian Ferreira. And uh, it's very exciting uh, from a policy perspective because it's been developed in collaboration with government and it's going, to inform, it's going to inform industrial policy in the UK. And it's very focused on simplicity, documentation, responsiveness and accessibility. And I'm just very quickly now going to show you what the map does. So um, if you go to the map, basically you can, basically what we contain here is different indicators that tell us about the state of an innovation ecosystem. So funding that um, a place, a, a, a location receives, scores in research excellence, number of research projects, graduate like startups, uh, collaboration between university and industry, trademarking patents, research and development, complexity, economic complexity, and then things which have more to do maybe with the quality of place, like broadband speed, speed, housing affordability. And the idea is that basically for each of these indicators, uh, if you click on one of them, I don't know this one, you're able to see like trends over time and how they evolve. And you can able to like look at the rankings and things like that. But then you can also say, let's look at the geography. And you can look at the geography and basically compare the situation in different places. A feature that's very exciting to me is that you're able to filter uh, by different locations so that you could say, I want to compare the situation in the Northeast 
with the East and with London. And then basically this allows you to just uh, compare the situation between, between these different regions. And also you can look at the distribution just for them. And then you can look at how the situation evolves over time by clicking here. So you see, this is quite a, a nice, powerful way of exploring the, the situation. And then you can also look at the trends and actually look at the evolution over time. Um, so it's really cool. Um, it's very, you can download all of the indicators here. You can look at all of the metadata, metadata from an indicator here, all of the sources, everything. You can download this indicator if you're interested by cl clicking here. Um, so it's, and, and also like if you want to really get into the nitty gritty of the indicators, you can go to the GitHub repo and you can say, I want to see how these guys created these indicators. So let's look at the code for, I'm just going to click on this one. And yeah, you can literally get into the Python code. We used to create indicators, so it's super transparent and super reproducible. And then maybe like the feature that is most exciting to me is like the level of accessibility that this has. So we have um, basically made the website highly customizable for users who might have different, uh, for example, visual impairments. So you can change the font, including to fonts that are uh, more user-friendly for people with dyslexia. Uh, you can change the size of the font for people who might, uh, I guess, have like site like site impairments. Um, you can change the letter spacing again to make it more readable for some people. Um, you can invert it and make it look like this again. Like some people would prefer to look at this in this way. Uh, basically, these are. Uh, changes in color for people with different uh, vision deficiencies. Um, and yeah, you can change the, basically it's completely customizable in a way that we feel makes it much more inclusive. Like, so basically any, anybody, with a visual, people with vision impairments are able to engage with it and, and use it uh, and adapt it to their needs in a way that's, I think, try to lower, like minimize barriers to entry for anyone using this map. Um, so yeah, this is um, something we're very, really excited about. And, and the thing to say is like all of this is open source so that people can use this approach to, to build their own maps. This is something that, yeah, it's, uh, we are very proud of having done it this way. And we hope that this is something that continues to be developed, continues growing, offers new, new ways to explore the data and also adds new indicators and, and new ways to visualize. So, uh, so yeah, watch this space. Um, another map that we have built, which is, this one is more of a prototype, it's still like, uh, it has, still hasn't been re released, is Health Mosaic. And this is a map uh, of uh, health innovation that we have developed with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the US. And the idea is here is can we map health innovations around research, around um, what businesses do around social networking and, and meetups and communities that come together around health issues so that funders are able to look at, at the situation and maybe identify pe new people to work with. Um, and yeah, in this one is, I mean, it's very, very cool. It's more of a search engine. And um, in this one, what you can do is search for um, a topic. Like say, let's look for machine learning, activity around um, around health. It's a bit slow. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's not public yet, because we need to, we are figuring out how to make it more uh, work faster. But yeah, basically you get a list of, um, in this case, machine learning research to do with, um, to do with health. Uh, based on data from the national, like the National Insurance uh, Health Reporter, um, based on Crunchbase and based on, on Meetup. And you can look at the geography by country, what countries are doing uh, this research. You can look at the locations. So actually, and the nice thing about this is that basically as you say, say I'm interested in the research here, then when you go to the list, um, the list is just going to show you um, activity in the location you are zooming in. And then you can also look at this almost like the topical composition of the research and what our topics are 
are being investigated in different places. So again, you could say I'm interested in uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And again, if you go to the list, you're already like um, filtering by that by that tab. And also like you can look at who the funders here uh, are here. So you see like it's a uh, um, very powerful, quite complex visualization. Uh, but it's one that um, we're really excited about because we believe it offers like a completely new way, I guess, for like in, of, of like almost like flipping, be, be flicking between different tabs and different ways of searching uh, in order to, I guess, understand the phenomenon. Uh, so that's health mosaic. Um, thinking about jobs. So this is like an area where we have done a lot of work as well. And the question is, can we manage the disruption in labor markets brought about by emerging technologies like AI, which I mentioned before, decarbonization and the pandemic? Um, and here um, we have, for example, done a lot of work around almost like building taxonomies of skills that reflect better the situation in, in the labor market as it exists today, which is changing very rapidly. Um, so we have spent a lot of time looking at online job ads in order to extract the skills from them and then look at how these skill, skills cluster together and what the skills are relevant for different jobs and what the skills, um, what, what, what is the impact, economic value of different skills and so forth. And uh, we, have, we have visualized all of this interactively and, and, and I'll show you like uh, one of these maps. Sorry, just click here. Um, so this is like um, the skills taxonomy I mentioned, and the idea is that you're able to break up skills into different clusters based on um, based on their concurrences on um, job ads. And if you say I'm interested in a different in an occupation, it basically tells you what are the key skills that you need in order to be in that occupation. Um, you can also look at the value of different skills like and, and how they are associated to different salaries. So you can imagine that's quite interesting for someone thinking about what skills to acquire. Um, and also uh, we, we map uh, level of growth for the month for different skills and the salary in order to create maps that help people to identify, for example, in this case, data engineering is the skill that has the highest salary and the fastest growth. So, okay, if I'm like a young person thinking about what do I study, Data engineering looks like a good one to focus on. Whereas if we go here, um, I guess in terms of low salary and, and low growth, it looks something like extracurricular activities and childcare, which is obviously a. Uh, um, then this is very interesting to see this because we would I would think this is a highly societally valuable skill, but it seems that we are not paying for it in a way that would, would make people want to pursue it. So maybe this is a space for policy to think about how to how to address that. Um, so. As you see, this is potentially really useful for uh, policymakers and for um, workers and all sorts of people. Um, here, you see like the skills that are related to different occupations as well. You can look for data that for explore the data in that way. Um, and I guess we have been thinking, continued thinking about this issue in 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 and how do we create maps that help people to navigate the labor market in other work. Um, this one uh, is in a project funded by JP Morgan. And the idea is to almost like map what the skills are exposed to um, automation shocks and how can uh, people move, uh, out, uh, I guess, from those occupations into other occupations which are less exposed so that we make their livelihoods more resilient. Um, and again, we have done a lot of research in this area and there's like a lot of reports and lots of things to look at. Uh, but I guess I'm going to be focusing on the visualization, which is basically in this case, this is a map showing um, different, like every, every uh, bubble is one occupation. And basically the color is showing exposure to machine learning, the size. And it's also like uh, how, um, whether it is in a neighborhood where it has opportunities to jump into other occupations which are less exposed, um, which in this case we see actually like ICT obviously is going to be transferred by machine learning. So there's not that many occupations which are free of its impact, whereas in other cases, like the picture is a bit more mixed. So it's quite useful to understand what areas are going to be less resilient or less able, less able to benefit from automation or move away from being exposed to automation in a way that could lead to um, 
uh, labor displacement. And then the idea is that you were able to almost like give people options in this case to say someone who's a shop assistant. So what could they, what other jobs could they get? How similar are these, their jobs to their current job? How similar are the work activities and the skills? What are the salaries of these other occupations? What are the levels of employment? Um, so we're all, almost like generate, identify viable, viable transitions for these people. Uh, as you see, like lots of different dimensions that you can use to um, give people a very sophisticated view of their options in terms of what do they, what do, they do next uh, with their careers if they feel that where they are now is highly exposed to automation in a way that um, is going to create economic challenges from them, for them down the line. And then also like the question becomes for policymakers, how do we take um, almost like occupations which are highly exposed to automation or to COVID or to decarbonization, maybe in future work, and keep well, equip them with the skills which allow them to move into uh, occupations in a new economy where AI and machine learning are more important, where things are more sustainable, and what we do is more resilient to pandemics, which I guess all of us expect are going to keep coming our way. Uh, so yeah, I mean, obviously this is a, like a very quick tour of all of these maps. Hopefully it gives you a sense of what we're doing and, and I guess our approach all of the maps um, are linked uh, uh, in the in the presentation. So, so once you have the slides, you you can you can have a look at them and explore them at your leisure. And just to conclude, I just wanted to say something about the ways forward, and I guess leave a, a little bit of time for questions as well. So, how do we see the future of map making at Nesta? So, I guess um, as I said before, a lot of it for us is going to be about building infrastructure. Uh, like for example, uh, components to build visualizations, infrastructure to collect data and explore it. So that when the next crisis comes, when the next COVID-19 equivalent comes, we already have built the tools and we have built the, the, the way to work with data that allows us to understand the situation faster rather than having to do what happened this time around with COVID, which is we have to build the infrastructure and then do the analysis, which has slowed us down uh, and meant that policy, it took longer for policymakers to get the information they needed in order to make po their policy decisions. Um, also, we are very excited about immersion, you know, and I guess taking mapping into the metaverse and using virtual reality and augmented reality. And this thing you can see here is simply like a, pro a two prototype uh, to investigate um, basically research topics and how they are connected with each other and how they evolve over time. So every, every node is a research topic. And we're basically moving into the, from, the, from the past into the, into the future and how they become combined and generate new research fields and things like that. So we're very excited in, in exploring this. Uh, we're very interested in the idea of democratizing uh, the use of data through maps. Uh, and actually the example I'm sharing here is from uh, Jared Thorpe's work is the St. Louis map room where, where people in that city in the US um, create, basically the maps are created with data, but then the maps are used to start democratic conversations between different people about the situation in the city and, and maybe things that are not measured, uh, like for example, their emotions and feelings about different parts of the city and their experiences. So the map, the map almost like the, the data map becomes almost like the, big, the starting of a conversation both about what's mapped and what's not mapped. And also what does this mean for policy and how can communities also use these maps to um, inform their, their decisions and to drive so, social change. And I think that's like a really exciting, almost like more inclusive and open and participatory output of data science and machine learning that can inform policy compared to say predictions or recommendations, which is very often what we think that, that data science and machine learning generate. And this is really something that we, we want to explore in future work. Um, um, and yeah, finally, just impact. You know, uh, we, we want to create impact. We want to really see these maps being used and, and transforming how people understand their environment and how policymakers act and, 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 and make change. Um, and I guess, you know, we are doing a lot of work to develop maps which are going to be relevant for the Nesta missions I mentioned before. 
And this is just like a prototype example of something we have built, like it's, it's um, by my colleague, John Davis. And basically this is a map of food supply in, in Liverpool, which is a city in the north of the, of the UK. And the idea is to be able to map um, food maps and food supplies uh, and, and how um, basically almost like the geography of availability of this food supply maps against like um, different variables that have to do with inequality, to do with health, to do um, with uh, access to healthy food. Um, and, you know, the idea is to really help uh, the local community to um, really um, understand the situation and understand where there are gaps in food supply uh, so that uh, they can make uh, better interventions and, and, and really transform access to food and food security in, in the city. So it's like one example of something. This is just a prototype, something we're still developing, but kind of shows you uh, maybe in a way combines the, the data, combines the, the next missions and, our, and what we are focusing on, and also this idea of engaging with communities and policymakers to build something that has a big impact I guess, like on, on people on the on the ground, which is at the end of the day, what we are about. So I think that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, and obviously I've been talking for a lot and about lots of things and, but hopefully, you know, we have the 10 minutes for people to ask questions, see, see what they think, you know, like anything that you want to discuss, obviously let, we have some time now. So thanks so much for your attention and I'll uh, shut up and stop sharing. And also I'll, I'll, I'll go and fetch the link for the presentation and put it in the chat so everybody has it. Thank you. Hi Juan. Good to see you. Thank you so hey, much. How are you doing, Todd? <laughs> Very good. What time is it in the US right now? It like is, five. oh my gosh, it's uh, five, 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 <laughs> obviously I've been up for a while, 5.51 a.m. So okay. I did get a couple of hours sleep, um, but then was right back up, so. Um, but I was able to, to listen in to your, um, to your talk, and I, I think that's just some really wonderful stuff. I was really um, taken with that, the centrality that you give to the idea of the moral imagination, and I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that a little bit. How, you know, how do you make sure that, that's, that that stays in, in a sort of healthy state of, of development um, in terms of, um, as you're working and trying to orchestrate a team, um, how do you how do you preserve the commonality of mission, but also the the uh, the necessary practices that have to be involved to kind of spur on that moral imagination? It doesn't come naturally, right? <laughs> I mean, it's something that has to be no. worked at. And so, how do you, um, as a director or just as a, a member of a team, um, foster that and make sure that it's um, that it's sustained throughout a project. Yeah, it's very tough because basically what it entails is sometimes saying to a saying to a data scientist, actually, data is not the right a data data driven approach or a data led approach is not going to be the right approach for this project. Or telling a um, someone who likes to run experiments, actually, we're not going to run experiment here. It's going to be a different approach. So basically, I think like the way to the way to encourage them to almost like step outside of their silos and almost like recognize that their way is not necessarily like their way is not necessarily the way. It's just by having like this organizational mission and this respect for our beneficiaries and our users and our audiences. You know, and also like this to understand it's not about us and me we're getting to build a really cool map or use a very cool algorithm or this really exciting data set. It's not about how how is this going to be benefiting these people. And also like they being very, it's almost like just being very reflective about the values which are embedded in our tools and our methods. And you know, accepting that, for example, you know, say with data, data science is very often about efficiency, right? How do we target things? How do we match things? How do we make things more productive? How do we avoid wasting resources? And that's one way of looking at a problem, right? 
Another could be it's much more autonomy about autonomy. It's much more about giving people agency, and actually just to recognize that. And, and then it's interesting to think, okay, in a context where you're giving people agency and autonomy, can you use data? What methods can you use? And maybe that connects with the point I made before. Maybe we don't want to build a machine learning algorithm making predictions. Maybe we want to build a map, you know, uh, or maybe we don't want to build a map and we just want to do a bottom-up workshop like uh, and just let people get together and brainstorm ideas in a more collective intelligence way. And I think like it's tough and it, and, and it has to be done at the right way. At the, at the right moment. One risk is that you do it too late in a project when people are already set in solutions and then basically it like sends things off the rails. Um, but if you do it at the right time and, and, and you, you have with people with the right culture and the, with the right understanding of what the stakes are for the audiences, or for the communities we work with, I think it can be very powerful and it makes us all yeah, better yeah, better servants, like uh, like for the, the needs of these people. And I think like down the line, better data scientists, because we are much more thoughtful about where we can apply our tools and the values that are embedded in those tools. So uh, yeah, it's a work in progress, but yeah, it's very, very exciting, yeah. very challenging. Yeah. You know, it, it's, you, you're talking, um, I'm wondering too, uh, uh, you know, in the considerations that you take for the, the audience, um, do you have discussions about, for instance, the way that um, a viewer or user will respond uh, emotionally to a particular approach? I just think about the way in this past year how um, mapping has been brought to so many people um, and has become such a vital part of their daily lives. I mean, how many people checked COVID maps, how many people in the States looked at election maps and not just for information, but, you know, to getting a sense of anger or, or fear or something like that. Um, do you, do, does that play a part in the conversation at all in terms of, of the way that the, the audience responds to it? And maybe also handling that, handling that ethically, knowing that the emotions can be manipulated. Yeah. Hmm. That's really interesting. Actually, we have, you know, we are very user driven and we create personas and stories and, you know, like all of these things to avoid having like this self centered kind of design, like of designing for ourselves. But actually, I would say that we have been paying so much attention to the emotional side. Maybe we have been a bit more functional, like in terms of like how. In the case of the of the health map, is like how would a health funder use this, or how would a community, like a like a person on the in the ground looking for health innovations, use this? But it's never been so much about how will they feel about seeing the information presented in this way, which is very interesting. And actually, maybe we are definitely missing a trick in not engaging with that a because we're not being able to be maybe as persuasive as we could on the on the more impact side. But also we are opening ourselves to ethical risks if we are becoming too persuasive or manipulative. So actually, maybe that's one emotional angle is something that we need to start incorporating into our analysis, into our user, on a user-driven process a bit more than we have so far. So thanks so much for flagging that thought. It's uh, something I'm going to take away and bring into <laughs> well, I was just, yeah, I was thinking about myself. I've been doing this for... Um... Oh, well, I've been involved with the exhibit for 12 years, and I, I just feel like in the last past year, um, I've never been so, um, had such an affective response to, <laughs> to mapping, yeah. and I kind of, sometimes I hate it, um, <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. want to see it, uh, but it's really been kind of driven home to me, and I think also if you're in the realm of thinking about, you know, how, how we do good, um, that's such a it's such an effective category too because it's it spurs us on to to want to do good right um to um but it can also be um perhaps something that can you know lead people astray too but uh yeah yeah well uh yeah it's interesting because i guess maybe some of these considerations will come into our work more at the at the front end like at the you know almost like when when we 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 um, are finalizing the visual the visualizations and thinking about the design, and you know maybe that's something that it would have been great if my colleague Kath was around because she's, for example, the what the one 
visualization person in Nesta, which is has been more focusing focused on storytelling through data visualization, which is obviously where there's always going to be an emotion. Right. And actually, there's like some work of hers that maybe has that element, more emotional element, for example, in the work she's done around um, gender diversity in media, gender diversity in research and science. So, um, yeah, but I think like, yeah, it's happened down the line when she's figuring out how to tell this story rather than at the beginning when thinking about what the, how the user is gonna be using this information. So yeah, again, great. Very interesting well, to think about. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, taking an hour of your time at a you know busy time of year, and uh, this has been really great to have you. And I look forward to um, seeing you in a couple of days. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for uh, for coming to us uh, and, and, and continue this conversation. And thanks for everybody in the audience, and thank you for inviting me. All right, take care now. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye.